Good morning, church. Pastor Sean here. So glad to be with you in our online worship this morning. As we said in our weekly update video on Friday, just want to let you know we are moving closer and closer to being able to resume in-person worship, targeting mid-July as our target date for resuming in-person worship in at least some form, uh, in some capacity. So continue to pray for the leaders of our church, for Pastor John and for our, our reopening team as they go through that process, uh, that we will be able to move safely into in-person worship in the near future. A couple of brief announcements for you, as I mentioned on Friday as well, a reminder about our food drive for the Haymarket Regional Food Pantry to help them restock their shelves at their new location just down the street from the church. You can bring those by the church anytime during the week, Tuesday through Friday, from 10 to 3, the building is open uh, while the staff is here. Just come on in the fellowship hall door, drop off your food on the table, uh, and then go on your way. We would do it ask that you wear a mask while you're in the building, if possible. Uh, last announcement for you this morning is that our blood drive is coming up. It seems like it's a long way away, but it's only a month out. Our July blood drive is scheduled for July the 25th from 8 to 1.30 uh, p.m. 8 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Uh, I encourage you to go to redcrossblood.org, redcrossblood.org. Use the sponsor code Gainesville UMC or just search for the zip code. You'll find it there. Uh, go ahead and sign up. Get those appointments now as the appointments will fill up. And if we get a ton of requests, they'll be able to add more phlebotomists to be able to have more appointments to serve more folks. Finally, this morning, I just want to take a moment of personal privilege and thank you once again for all the love and the support that you've shown to me and to my family over our six years here at Gainesville Church. This is my final Sunday with you. I'm looking forward to the challenges at Buck Hall and the excitement of a new church. But in this time, we're trying to say our goodbyes and to say goodbye well. As hard as that is through a camera and through Zoom and through other email and all other ways of uh, non-personal contact, we do want to note you know that we love you. We care about you. Uh, we hope and we will continue to pray for this church and for each one of you. You hold a dear, dear place in our hearts. Thank you. We love you. And let's have a word of prayer. Gracious and almighty God, we give you thanks for the opportunity to gather together in our homes to engage in this virtual worship. We give you thanks for the technology and the people who make that possible. God, as we prepare to uh, sing and to worship in our homes, to hear your word proclaimed, may your spirit move in mighty and powerful ways in, e in each one of us, in our homes, and in all the ways that you see possible, God. Move in us, stir up a love for you, a hunger for you and for your word. And be with Pastor John as he delivers this message, that his words might be your words, and that we might hear all that you have for us this day. All these things we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Say Christ the Lord. Christ the Lord is risen today. Again, 
Christ has lived. Hallelujah. Following our exalted head. Hallelujah. Be like him, like him we rise. Hallelujah. Stars across the green, the sky. Hallelujah. Oh, he is not dead. He is not dead. He is alive. We have the soul. Good morning, church. Welcome to this Sunday's service. I want to invite you to think about inviting a friend. All you have to do is call them up and say, hey, go to our website and you can join the worship service here at Gainesville Church. Now, at the risk of having everyone laughing, especially Adam, who's fi uh, filming this, the title of the message this morning is Time to Remember Our Sound. Time to remember our sound, the sound that the church is called by Jesus to make. Three scriptures this morning. The first one is from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. The second scripture is also from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 20. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Men swear by something or someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts to an end all arguments. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus who went before us has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now on this Father's Day, I want to tell you that we are going through changing times. So happy Father's Day to all of you dads out there. It's going to be a different day than it's been in the past. Bob Dylan probably said it best back in the 60s, a long, long time ago. The times, they are a changing. You know, and I can't remember in my lifetime another time or t uh, decade when things were changing so much and so swiftly, except in the 60s when Dylan wrote that song. Now the church is changing. It can't help but change. For the church is always having its methodology challenged, how we do things, but never the message. In days gone by, preachers didn't have microphones. You know what they had? They had this big, massive wood thing above their head. It was called a sounding board and it was specifically engineered so that when they spoke, the sound would bounce off of the sounding board and project out into the congregation. Now, when we were planning this building back in 2002, no one suggested that we explore the possibility of putting in a sounding board. You see, that was the methodology of communicating back in the 18th century. That wasn't the message. 
I remember the first time I saw a microphone that the preacher could move with. You know, one that had a, a lapel clip and it had a cord that was connected back to something. He could walk back and forth across the stage and he could talk and he was free. He could go as far as the cord would let him go. I remember the first time I saw it was probably back in 1969 at Federated Church in East Springfield, Pennsylvania, Dr. P.H. Augustine, as he preached, he would walk back and forth, back and forth, and he would engage the entire congregation that was seated there. It was a fairly large sanctuary, and there he would go back and forth, preaching his message. I thought it was really cool because I felt like he was really speaking to me some of the time because he was able to do that. Now, one time he told a story, Dr. Augustine did, about a preacher preacher had one of those cords attached to him with the microphone. preacher who was known for his fiery hell and damnation sermons. And he was there and he was striding back across the stage, back and forth. And every time he got to one edge of the stage, he'd give that microphone cord a snap. And he'd get to the other side and he'd give another snap. And you'd hear that out in the sanctuary. He would get to the end of the stage, snap that cord. Well, one day in the front row, was a mother. She was a visitor. She brought her four-year-old son with her. And as that preacher went back and forth, back and forth, snapping that cord, the little boy would burrow into his mother's side. She looked down and she could see he was obviously afraid. And then she looked up at the preacher and she saw maybe that, that was what she, he was afraid of. And she said to her little boy as that preacher kept going back and forth, snap, snap, at that microphone cord. She said, honey, don't worry, he's not coming down here. And the little boy looked at her with those big little boy eyes, a little quaver in his voice, and he said, but what happens if he gets loose? Well, that's an old joke from old technology, but you know what, it doesn't matter, it's not the message. I've learned something over my years in the ministry, and I've been a denominational preacher most of the time. Denominations, at least the ones in my experience, often struggle with changing their methodology. We often hold on to old methods way too long, and often when we do that, the message gets lost. We United Methodist as a whole, we were slow to embrace contemporary Christian music in our worship services. Even some of our churches, when they added contemporary worship, the traditionalists in the church resisted them. Non-denoms, for their most part, that's all they do, is contemporary Christian music. Most of them are growing, most United Methodist churches aren't. Now I'm not saying that there isn't a place for traditional worship in our services. What I am saying is that we need to change our methodology as times change. Those generations that are under 50, even under 40, they don't know the hymns of the church. They know the contemporary Christian songs, many of them listen to them on the radio. And I'm thankful for something here at Gainesville Church. We don't fight that much over methodology. We want the message to get through. So we have both traditional services and we have contemporary services because we want people to worship and be filled with the message so that when they go out of this place, they contain and they share the message. Again, we United Methodists were very slow in adopting social media and live streaming. Again, the non-denoms, as soon as the technology was available, they embraced it and they started live streaming their services. They were on Snapchat, they were on Twitter, they were on Facebook. We were slow to the party. You see, they understood that the methodology isn't the important thing, it's the message and getting the message to the people who don't know Jesus. Methodists were slow to that party. We resisted the method and often, Many times, our message got lost. Here at Gainesville, we're kind of ahead of the curve on those things because of our great staff. They were already planning and doing live streaming about a year and a half, two years ago. We were working on it here because we have a great staff that understands all of those things. Now I've instructed my staff that while we're still in this pandemic, while we're still semi-locked down, we're gonna explore even more how to use all forms of social media. Not that they're all gonna stick, not that we're all going to, we're gonna to continue to use all of them, but we're going to find a way to use the methodology that allows us to 
communicate the message because it's the message that's important. One thing I know that as we make our way through this pandemic is things are going to change. And for the foreseeable future, our methodology has to change. How we present the good news of Jesus Christ to the world has been changed by this pandemic. In fact, I predict that we will never really get back to what we called the good old normal, the way it was before, not entirely. Some things have changed for good. Once we were an in-person church that had an online presence. Right now, we are an online church that has almost no in-person presence. Even as we move out of this pandemic, and we will, we will make our way out of this, I'm sure of that. Our surveys have shown us, and my personal conversations with many of the people in this church, that they're not gonna feel comfortable coming back to church, not for a fairly long time. Some folks don't feel comfortable coming back until there's a vaccine and they've had the vaccine for coronavirus. And I understand that. And I want them to feel comfortable. So we'll continue to do what we're doing online. We'll even enhance what we're doing online. But I think it's a great opportunity for us to rethink church by asking ourselves and being very honest with ourselves. One very important question. Do we love our methodology more than we love the message and the mission of the church? Do we love the traditions of the church, the way that we have always done things, more than we love people hearing our sound? I know from that old sermon series, making the sound of the church because the sound of the church, the only sound that Jesus gave us is to go and reach new people with the gospel. Sean talked about it last week in a really good sermon. He was talking about the go of the gospel. Sean and I actually preached a sermon series about a year ago. It was on the go commands of the gospel. We also talked about it in that sermon series a year and a half, two years ago, about making our sound. I know everyone jokes about it, everyone laughs about it. Pastor John, one more, help us to get one more. Going back to that Hacksaw Ridge movie where Desmond Doss was trying to get just one more. Well, folks, now is the time for us to pivot and to really embrace the idea of our message. And that message was designed to reach one more. One more for the kingdom of God. Often the reason that United Methodist churches, probably true in all denominations, don't do a better job of reaching new people is that they've embraced their methodology of how they do things. They've held on to their methodology. They've remained loyal to their methodology more than they have their message. So the question for us today, where do our affections lie? With the message or with the methodology? Before you answer that question, I want you to think about two things. Things have changed in our country. Many of them will never go back to that old normal. So how can we make our sound getting one more into the kingdom of God? How do we do that with this changed world? I think we have something very, I think we have something that the world desperately needs at this time. You see, our faith is our hope. It's not I wish upon a little star kind of hope, but it's a sure and certain hope. That first scripture I read from Hebrews, a sure and certain hope. That's the sound that we have to offer to the world. It's what Paul's talking about in 2 Corinthians. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are always being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an internal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. Folks, we don't lose heart. We followers of Jesus Christ. If we have this sure and certain hope in us, we don't lose heart. Even when things on the outside are crumbling around us, we hold on to our hope because our hope is not temporary. Our hope is eternal. Inwardly, we're being renewed by this hope because our God through the Holy Spirit is renewing us. That's our hope in the moment right now. And yes, we're experiencing troubled times, but they're light in comparison 
to what God has prepared for us. We're going through difficult times, but God has prepared something for us that lasts in eternity. In our world today, that sometimes sounds like pie in the sky kind of faith. It seems unsophisticated, but it's the message of the gospel that we've been redeemed for an eternity. That's our hope for eternity. We have both to offer our world. Hope in the present moment, in the here and now, and hope for an eternal future. That is our sound. That is the sound that we are called to make in the world. I think we've lost that. Sometimes I think we feel that we're just not sophisticated enough, urbane enough when we say those things. But I believe firmly that in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of the racial division in our country right now, people want hope. They want hope in the here and now, and they want hope for the future, and they want a sure and certain hope. We, as Jesus' church, we need that kind of hope for ourselves as well. We'll find it in him. Our hope is also our anchor, the anchor for our souls in these turbulent times. In the ancient world, the anchor was a symbol of hope. So when the writer of Hebrews says these words, an anchor, our hope is our anchor for the soul, he's hearkening back to those words or that idea that comes from the Greek world. Pythagoras, that great mathematician and philosopher, once said, wealth is a weak anchor, fame is still weaker. What then are the anchors which are strong? Wisdom, great-heartedness, courage. These are the anchors which no storm can shake. But you know what? Our anchor is even greater than those three because our anchor is Jesus Christ and he is the embodiment of wisdom and of great-heartedness and courage. This is our sound, folks. This is the message of hope that we have for our world going through such difficult times. Our anchor keeps us rooted and grounded and not washed away by every new wave of information that crashes in on us. And believe me, each day we get a new wave. It's a new wave of the pandemic. Something new that's happened. Oh, the second spike is coming or a new wave that crashes in on us of the racial division in our country. Each day we get it and we're overwhelmed. These are the realities of 2020. And we as the church, we don't shirk from those realities. We stand up and we say, but we have a hope, a sure and certain hope in the midst of these days, in the midst of COVID-19, in the midst of racial division, we have a hope. It's a sure and certain hope in Jesus Christ, in a Christ who changes lives, who changes brokenness, who changes hearts. After about three months of lockdown and the growing divisions in our country, we've all grown a little bit weary. No, I take that back. We've grown very weary. We have a message, church. We have a sound offer to this weary world. The way that we communicate this message, it's changed. And it's going to change in the near future and probably for the rest of our lives. But the methodology, the methodology is not the message. And the message hasn't changed. It's a message of hope. Not just for them that don't know Jesus. It's a message of hope for us. It's a sure and certain hope. So when we're communicating this message, we need to internalize it as well. We need to say, yes, my hope is sure and my hope in Christ is certain. Do you have that sure and certain hope? Maybe you've never found that in your life. Maybe you've never had your heart transformed by Jesus Christ. It can happen. If you'd like to talk about it, you can send me an email. John P. at Gum Church. You can call the church at 703-754-4511. I want to share with you how you can find a hope in the midst of these turbulent and difficult times. I'd like you to find, I'd like to help you find a sure and certain hope. To share that hope with the world, we need to have it for ourselves. And if we need to have it for ourselves, we need to learn where we need to look to find it. We don't look at this world. 
So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. We don't fix our eyes on what is temporary, but what is eternal. Now more than ever, the church needs to get back to its core message. Jesus Christ, crucified, dead, buried, and risen. Jesus Christ, healer, fixer of broken lives, changer of hearts, savior, and the giver of life eternal. Once again, I'm deeply saddened by the racial strife and angst in our society. This is my second time through something like this. I remember the 60s. I was much, much younger. I was almost 12 years old when Dr. Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy were assassinated in 1968, just two months apart. I remember the riots, but I didn't fully comprehend what was going on in our country, the inequality, the suffering of a group of people. I understand it much better today. And the hope that I have, the hope that the church has to offer the world, isn't legislation. Not saying that new legislation is not needed. The hope that the church has isn't found in marches and protests. Although peaceful protests and marches are part of our heritage, if that's what you want to do, I encourage you to do it. But my, if my perspective that I've gained through all these years, from the civil rights movement of the 60s, and all that I saw, and all that I'm continuing to see, if it's taught me anything, it's this. Hearts need to be changed. And legislation doesn't change hearts. Jesus changes hearts. It's time for the church to wake up and get back to its core message. It's time for us when we are coming out of this lockdown to regain our voice and say, our message, our message of transformed hearts and lives, our message of hope, a sure and certain hope, it's what the world needs. We've been blinded, thinking that we have to do different things to be relevant in the world today. No, we need to get back to making our sound, the sound of the church. And it's one thing, it's introducing people to Jesus so that they can find that sure and certain hope that their hearts can be transformed. But all too often in times of crisis, the church has kind of retreated back into its traditions back into its methodology to make it feel like maybe we can get back the old times. That's methodology, folks. That's the way you do something. The message never changes. We sometimes long for those simpler days of the past when things were different and we observed all of our rituals in the process. We may not have seen that we were losing our message. We feel the outrage over social injustice, but we forget that hearts can be changed by Jesus Christ. There is hope, sure and certain hope, but only if we get back to our message, our core message, our sound. That's our core message. That's the message of the church. Jesus changes hearts. And when people have their hearts changed, they change the world. That's the message of the church. The methodology, it's gonna change. It's changing right now, it's going to continue to change. But it doesn't affect the message. A hope in Jesus Christ, sure and certain. Amen. Folks, here are the questions for our small groups. What makes the message of Jesus, and therefore what should be the message of the church, a message of hope? That's question number one. What makes the message of Jesus and therefore the message of the church a message of hope? Number two, what are the two elements, or maybe I should say time frames, of this message of hope? What are the two time frames of this message of hope? And number three, in your lifetime, how has the church strayed from this core message? How has the church strayed in your lifetime from this core message? And then number four, why do you think we have strayed? Why do you think the church has strayed? I'm kind of answering question number three because I believe the church has strayed, but why do you think we've strayed? 
So those are the questions for this week's small groups. And if you're not in a small group, I would encourage you to explore that at info at gumchurch.com because our small groups are going to continue even when we get back into the building. We're going to continue with creating new small groups, some virtual, some in person. I would encourage you to think about that. And even if you're not in a small group and don't plan to be in one, maybe you can answer these questions in your mind. Thanks. I'm no longer a slave to fear And I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear And I am a child of God And you unravel me. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Sing, I'm no longer. I'm no longer a slave to fear And I am a child of God oh, I'm no longer I'm no longer a slave to fear And I am a child of God mother's womb you have chosen me and love has called my name I've been born again to your family your blood flows through my veins sing I'm no longer I'm no longer I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. And I am a child of God. Oh, I'm no longer.
I'm no longer slave to fear And I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear And I am a child of God together I want to be close I want to be close close to your side so heaven is real and death is a lie I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one
Folks, as we complete week 14 of our virtual worship, I really wish we could all be here in the sanctuary where we're filming this today. I wish we could be back together as a church. But as I said in the message, our core message is really one of hope, of God transforming our lives both for the here and now and for eternity. And in that hope for the here and now, I hope that we're soon back in worship together. I want you to know, and we've said it already today, I want you to know that we're working very hard on preparing a plan that will meet our bishop's requirements to be able to be back in person and worshiping together. So as we go out today into the world, because we're allowed to do more of that in stage two or phase two from the governor's recommendations, I want us to go out and share a message of hope. I think our world's become very weary and very much without hope. And so I would say, let us be the hands and feet of Christ by offering hope to the world around us. Go now in that peace and that hope. Amen.